What's ringing my bells? I am Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards, the show where every week I try out a new introduction. This one got Sophie's approval, so uh, that's good. It's also a show where we talk about the worst people in all of history, tell you the things you don't know about them. My guest today is David Christopher Bell! Hello! How you doing, Dave? I am well. I almost hit a man with my car on the way here. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Did he have it coming? Yeah, actually. He was good. jaywalking. Whoa, fuck him. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share a little bit of your personal business, Dave, because sure. it makes me laugh. Uh, your parents came here from the the blighted hellscape that is the East Coast to escape the snow. Yes, that's true. They are very old, so they do what old people do, and they went to a warm climate mm-hmm. during the winter. And then Los Angeles got its first snow in sixty something years. <laughs> it sure <laughs> did. <laughs> They are very bummed out, because uh, when it's not snowing, it's been raining nonstop. Yeah. We've had our first winter in decades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which has been delightful. It's been great for the people who live here. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. Especially after the summer, uh, although it is a dire sign of climate change when Los Angeles has seasons. Yeah, the world is dying. The world but it's is cool. clearly it's dying. It's nice out, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's nice to get to wear a jacket mm-hmm. yeah. in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Dave. <laughs> Today we are talking about a special fellow, very special fellow. Okay. Have you ever heard the name Saparmurat Niazov? No. Oh, boy. Oh, no. Oh, oh <laughs> boy. Now, the last show we had you on was Momar Gaddafi. That's uh, true. Gaddafi's kind of the gold standard for just a lunatic who winds up in charge of a country. Mm-hmm. Like, not like a guy like like Hitler or Stalin. People call them crazy, but they really weren't. Like, if you, if you look at them, everything they did kind of made sense. Right. Just, like, based on where they're coming from. Gaddafi was a fucking maniac. Uh, and Saparmurat Niazov may be even crazier than Gaddafi. He might oh, be the wow. craziest person who's ever run a country. Uh, <sighs> but we'll have to judge that at the end of these episodes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am ready. Before we get into that, uh, I have a new sparkling water beverage uh, called Bubbly. And I, I got it hoping for an orange soda of some sort, but I don't know if that's what it is or if it's more like one of those uh, one of those LaCroix. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn right now. All right. How is it? It's actually really nice. It is on the LaCroix scale. But, so it's uh, like someone put an orange in it's like sparkling a, it's water. It's like an orange was in the same room as some sparkling mm. water. Um, but in this case, the orange talked to the water, uh, and, okay. and they, they reached an accord. It's good. Okay. It's good. Yeah. It's like a melted popsicle. Uh, bubbly. I'm going to have to try it. <laughs> if you want to You want to pour some show, in mine? Yeah. I'll okay. pour it in your LaCroix. All right, here we go over the over the equipment. <laughs> this is oh, we're really reaching across the table. Oh, Jesus. All right. Is it good? Has it mixed with that uh Not the great, passion? Robert. <laughs> 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 um, but I'm going to keep drinking it. So uh, that's a little bit of science for you listeners at home. Do not mix passion fruit LaCroix with orange bubbly. No. Uh, not a good idea. All right. Speaking of bad ideas, let's talk about Saparmurat Niazov, the lunatic god king of Turkmenistan. <laughs> I'm so psyched. <laughs> so uh, today we're talking about a guy who was at one point probably the most powerful crazy person on planet Earth. Uh, he was the absolute ruler of a nation of five million people. So Parmarat Niazov was the dictator of Turkmenistan, and I think you're going to enjoy him, Dave, although Turkmenistan did not. Okay. Um, I am extremely ignorant of the world. Mm-hmm. So, so where is Turkmenistan? It's like near Afghanistan and in 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 the old Soviet Union. Okay, uh, it's one of those little chunks of the country. It was like when Genghis Khan started doing his thing when sure. he like left China and started conquering his way towards the Middle East. They were like the first empire he ran into on his way out of China. Okay, yeah, and he had to he, had, he fucked him up pretty bad. Okay. Uh, so Turkmenistan, the actual country, did not exist as a political entity until 1924. Like it wasn't a thing anyone had ever thought about as like an area. It was just a place where a bunch of like it had been a bunch of different kingdoms, but like no one had called them Turkmenistan or whatever. Uh, they wound up under Russian control during the era of the czars, and not much was done with them. They were a little bit of a backwater. So they pretty much just stuck to themselves and did Turkmen stuff, which mainly meant outdoor picnics, uh, fantastic wine, and horseback riding. Oh, good um, for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They seemed, to have, they seemed to have their shit together. Yeah, they were just like, no one's noticing us. Yeah. Uh, let's just have a great time. <laughs> let's just chill out. Uh, they like falcons, big, big falcon well, people. who doesn't? Who doesn't love a good falcon? They got great horses, and uh, they're one of those... Pieces of the Muslim world where everybody drinks still because uh, okay. they like became Muslim, but they'd been growing wine since before they were Muslim. So they were like, "Well, 
Let's just ignore that <laughs> we've part. We've been drunk <laughs> earlier yeah. than we've been Muslim, yeah. so. <laughs> it's got grandfathered into the religion. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, in 1924, the brand new Union of Soviet Socialist Republics decided this chunk of the world and its people needed an official designation and borders. The Turkmen SSR was considered to be the backwateriest backwater in the entire Soviet Union, uh, save maybe some of those chunks of Russia that were too cold for anything but gulags. Mm-hmm. Uh, an American diplomat told New Yorker author Paul Thoreau that, quote, it was the sleepiest, most remote, least favored of the USSR's republics. So they don't get much love. Yeah, but I, I mean, I want to live there. Yeah, if you're going to live in the Soviet Union, you want to live in the place that like S- Stalin doesn't think about ever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. and they were they were basically the Soviet Union's gas station. Uh, okay. They had like have like either the third or the fifth largest natural gas reserves in the world, and so the Soviet Union just kind of took all of their fuel and and didn't really give them money for it, and that that was kind of what happened for. Like 70 years or so. Right. So they were, they were doing fine. Uh, so Parmarat Niazov was born into this quiet region of the world in 1940. His father was Ataya Niazov, a, a farmer, and his mother was Gurban Sultan Eje. They lived in the town of Gipchak, a small village six miles from the capital, Ashgabat. If you know much history, you're probably aware that 1940 was not a great time to be born in the Soviet Union. The Nazis invaded before Saparmarat was won, and in 1942, his father died in battle fighting the Wehrmacht. Mm. So... Not the best start so far. No, a yeah. bit of a bummer. Bit of a bummer. The Dad. Nazis really ruined it. <laughs> yeah, the Nazis there. really fucked things up for this yeah. kid. <laughs> and 20 million other people. Yeah. 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 Uh, this prompted Saparmarat's mom to move them into the capital, where they all lived together until 1948, when a massive earthquake struck the city and killed 110,000 people, including Saparmarat's entire family. Okay, so he's just having none of the luck. <laughs> none of the luck. Yeah. Really, really bad first eight years of his life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rough... Rough start, um, fair to say. So young Saparmarat grew up in a Soviet orphanage uh, until the government found a family member he'd never met for him to go live with. Uh, In spite of the rough start, he did pretty well, winning a place in Leningrad Polytechnical Institute and graduating with a degree in power engineering in 1966. Uh, He got a job at a power plant near the capital, and uh, it seemed like he was just going to be a normal Soviet dude. So far, so good. So yeah. far, so good. Rough start, but he, he's getting his life on track. Getting his life on track, working as an engineer. Mm-hmm. If I know anything about engineers, it's that they never turn into power-crazed maniacs. Right. Yeah, that's that's for sure <laughs> something about engineers that we know. <laughs> uh, so Parmarat joined the Communist Party back in 1962, and his ambitions immediately extended beyond just working at a power plant. Throughout the late 1960s and the 1970s, he steadily rose the ranks in local politics, due largely to the fact that he was a member of the largest Turkmen tribe in the region, the Teki. Now, uh, Saparmarat Niazov was named the first secretary of the Communist Party of Turkmen by Mikhail Gorbachev in 1985. Hmm. Uh, he was put in power because his predecessor, a guy named Gapasov, had been incredibly corrupt uh, and and stealing huge amounts of money from, you know, the, the Republic. So right. that's that's his predecessor. Now, the good thing about Gapasov is that he'd almost completed construction of the world's longest aqueduct during his term. So it was like a couple of weeks away from being finished when he got shit canned, and then Niazov comes to power, and he immediately takes credit for building the aqueduct. Oh, which, yeah, oh nice. Good move. Good yeah. move. Solid. Yeah. <laughs> So Gorbachev promised that Niazov's promotion meant the dawning of a new age of corruption-free governance in Turkmenistan. This would prove to be about as wrong as a statement can be. That feels like how a lot of monsters start. Yeah. Of, like, the guy before them was terrible and mm-hmm. corrupt, and they come up and they're like, no more corruption. No more corruption. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's a good pitch. That's like, basically how this starts. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he probably would have gotten busted by Gorbachev uh, eventually because he was really corrupt too. Mm-hmm. But about five years after he comes to power, the USSR starts to fall apart. And so when the Soviet Union collapses, he's the guy in charge of Turkmenistan. So in like 1990, the Turkmen parliament declares its independence during a couple of different votes. And on October 26th, 1990, the state of Turkmenistan was officially born. It held its first presidential election immediately afterwards. Niyazov was the only candidate, and he received 98.3% of the vote. So Okay, so yeah, as everything collapsed around him... He yeah. just took it's like having it's like being the manager at the final blockbuster. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and just being like, We're gonna do things differently <laughs> yeah, around I'm here. In charge now. your blockbuster now. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, he is he is that guy. Uh so as the autocratic ruler of a new nation, Niazov's immediate goal was to be as neutral as possible and make a shitload of money. So not a bad plan at the start. No. Uh, he started selling gas, oil, and electricity to Iran, but also sweet-talked Saudi Arabia, 
and flew to Mecca to do his pilgrimage. So he's kind of trying to play both sides of, of every angle. He's okay. trying to be nice to Russia, be nice to the U.S. He just doesn't want anybody to fuck with Turkmenistan. So reasonable. That's, so yeah, far. that's fair. He's protecting his people. <laughs> protecting his people. Uh, now, when he came to power, most Turkmen were still dirt poor because the Soviet Union had basically just been stealing their gas. Like... Paying them, but paying them in Soviet money that wasn't worth anything, oh, okay. and being like, "Yeah, you guys are getting a fair market value for this fuel." Like it, it was, it was a free gas station for the Soviet Union. But now that they were an independent nation, these guys had like a, a shitload of money, at, like something like five billion dollars a year coming in in uh, in fuel money. And there's only five million people, right. so it, in a fair and equitable system. Everyone in Turkmenistan could be really rich. Yeah. Like like they are in Kuwait and or something. I, of like course, that. I assume that's what's going to happen. Yeah, that they all get taken care of really well. Yeah. And, uh, and then it's just we're a golden done age. with the episode. <laughs> yep. That, yeah. That's it. Well, uh, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at BastardsPod, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, so that was what a lot of people hoped for that like the economy would be reformed and they'd all get some of this sweet, sweet gas money. Mm-hmm. But Niazov was worried about what might happen if he reformed the economy too much. He thought it might be too much change for people mm. in too short a period of time. Right. You got to protect the people you gotta, from progress, from money, and change, <laughs> and money. <laughs> you don't want those people to have. <laughs> Who knows what they'll spend it on? Exactly. Yeah. Houses, Ooh. food. Ooh. Yeah. You know, you don't want to risk that. So he promised that he would eventually add in some free market stuff, uh, but in the short term, he decided that he really needed absolute power to get stuff started sure. on a good foot. You know? You know? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Makes it's, sense. It's understandable. I just, need a little, I just need a little absolute power. Just a couple quick. of years of yeah, yeah, absolute yeah. power. Yeah. Oh, I swear, I will, I, I'll, I'll give it up. Yeah, give like up. all the times people have given up yeah. absolute power in the past. <laughs> Uh, So he got his wish when Turkmenistan's new constitution was drafted in 1992. It declared that power is held by the president who was elected by the people, which seems reasonable until you realize that once elected, the president's power was essentially infinite. Uh, and that included the power to determine how elections were held in the future. Oh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Now, under the Constitution, citizens did have the right to form political parties. As long as they could get a thousand other people together, that was like the minimum threshold, you could make a political party. Okay. So several citizens did this. They created political parties. They they kept in line, scrupulously followed the law. They avoided any calls for violence. They filled out all the required forms of petitions, uh, and their parties were immediately banned. Hmm. Um, since the state controlled all media, uh, no political parties were allowed any airtime. So, yeah. That that's uh, that, that's what how Niazov sort of starts off. Okay. Uh, Tagan Jumakov, a journalist working for a state paper that was essentially owned by Niazov, explained, "Quote: At this time, there is no need for a multi-party system. Many problems have to be solved, social <laughs> problems, and we must raise living standards. When our living standards are high and we are economically independent, then we can have a multi-party system. But if this happens now, there will be anarchy." Feels like there's a lot of putting putting it off. It's putting a it lot off. of like, you know, no, it's a great, it's great. We'll do that at some point. Mm-hmm. But right now, we really can't. Yeah. I'll clean up my room after Right. I, yeah. I finish stealing all this natural gas money. Yeah. yeah. I'll clean up my room, but first I gotta do this cocaine. <laughs> yeah. And that'll help me clean up. I my can't room. I can't make my bed with all this cocaine on the table. Exactly. <laughs> what have I what have I knocked the cocaine off the table? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Nia's that that that, that logic isn't <laughs> exactly how Niazov justifies what he does. Yeah. So at a people's council in December nineteen ninety two, uh Niazov estimated it would take ten years for Turkmenistan to achieve the prosperity it needed for people to be allowed to vote. Uh, after the Constitution was ratified, Niazov ran for president again, winning 99.5%. Oh. Uh, yeah, he's, he's very popular. Very popular. Good very, for him. Very po- Also the only candidate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, he was the only Central Asian head of state to continue to govern after the USSR's fall. So of, of the guys who are in charge when like the Soviet Union falls apart, he's the only one who manages to hang on to power. Okay. Um, now, Turkmenistan had never been a country before, not in the modern sense of the world. And Niazov knew he had to do something to bind all of his people together. So he held conferences using sketchy history to claim that all Turkmen were part of the same ethnic group, the Turan, which was essentially just an ancient Persian word for the region. He also announced, to great fanfare, that his name was now Turkmen Bashi, which means first among Turkmens. He created an ethnic group? Yeah, kind of. Okay. He just said, we're all this thing. That's bold. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he didn't want the tribalism to get in the way, so mm-hmm. he said, we're all part of the same thing now. All right. Yeah, you got to invent stuff if you're yeah. going to create a country. Uh, his full title was Serdar Turkmen Bashi, great leader of all Turkmen. Now, as natural gas money started to flow into the country, Turkmenistan found itself with money for the first time in ever, really. Mm -hmm. Turkmen Bashi, a man who had promised his people prosperity, knew what he had to spend his windfall on. Wait, 
What do you think it was? Oh God, I don't know. What, what do you What do you think he spent the billions of dollars that is the first money his country's ever gotten on? I mean, this could go in so many ways. <laughs> it could be like war, and, um, but I feel like it's like a, a clown party or something. Like <laughs> that's not super far off. I watched. I've listened to enough of this show to <laughs> to not make too many predictions. He spent it all on statues. Hey! Oh, of course, <laughs> of course, of course. Why course didn't I think statues. of that? Oh man, that's. Uh, I think there's something in our DNA where we want to. It's just a natural thing we want to do is make statues. Make like if you give me, statues. if you gave me a million dollars, I'd be like, okay, well, the statue, um, and then yeah. I'll get a nice apartment. I guess a second RoboCop statue in, mm-hmm. in, in Detroit would make sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's do that first, and then another Rocky statue in Philadelphia. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> all slightly bigger, all slightly yeah. larger. <laughs> she like drive the statue by homeless people in the street and like <laughs> yeah it was expensive Check but out guys the statue, it's guys. gonna be worth it <laughs> uh new yorker writer paul thoreau visited turkmenistan near the end of turkmen bashi's reign here's how he described the capital city quote Ashgabat was filled with gold statues of Turkmen Bashi. In these statues, which had an ecclesiastical aura, Bashi was El Dorado, the man of gold, all-powerful and all-knowing. Statues show him sitting, striding, waving, saluting, and smiling a 24-carat smile. One even showed him as a precocious golden child, sitting in the lap of his bronze mother. He once said to a journalist, I admit it, there are too many portraits, pictures, and monuments of me. I don't find any pleasure in it, but the people demand it because of their mentality. Yeah, guys, just give me a few more years... (laughs) Everything will be fine. We'll get a few more statues up, and then that's it. <laughs> we just an, an, we, a couple of more statues, and yeah. we'll have democracy. I yeah, promise. I swear you're going to vote at some point. <laughs> yeah. I do love that it, like, he, he makes his mom bronze, but he's gold. As oh, a yeah. <laughs> a little, little bit of mom shade there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just more aesthetically ple- pleasing. Yeah, you want the baby to, to really pop. Yeah, exactly. In your, in your statue of yourself as a baby. Yeah. Now, we don't know what the people actually demanded because they weren't, you know, allowed to vote mm-hmm. or form political parties or speak freely. Uh, several of them were eventually allowed to operate political parties, but these were just for show, and most did not meet the minimum number of members uh, required in the Constitution. It was just so that Turkmen Basha could be like, no, we're not a one-party state. Right. Look at all these other parties. There's like nine guys in that one. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever Turkmen Pashi got in hot water with the democratic world, he'd sponsor a party or two and let his people have the illusion of a tiny amount of choice. Or, mm. to be more accurate, let the world have the illusion that his people had a tiny amount of choice. Right. Now, Niyazov uh, immediately started renaming parts of the country after himself. Uh, it started, not crazily at least, changing the name of a major street in the capital from Lenin to, you know, Turkmen Bashi. That's fair. That's, That's fair. fair. You know, yeah. the Soviet Union's gone. You don't want it named after Lenin. Okay. We name streets after presidents all the time. Yeah, uh, He renamed a collective farm uh, in the Linen Canal uh, with his own name also. Uh, when people compared what he was doing to Stalin's personality cult, he said, quote, Stalin achieved his personality cult through repressive measures, whereas I achieved my popularity without conflicts. So mm-hmm. overall, I'm just sorry. I'm thinking about his childhood and stuff. There's nothing like that messed up that happened to him. Well, I mean, there's parents the, both the parents died, died before he was eight. And the earthquake. <laughs> I'm saying that there's not anything like... Horrible things happen to a lot of people. Yeah. This feels like a story of like, this is just like you give someone too much power. This yeah. It feels like this could be anybody. It's well, just like, let's give them a lot of power. And then uh, the next thing you know, they're a golden baby statue. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible. We'll see how you feel at the end of this. Okay. I, I feel like he so, might have. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so So far, I'm not saying what he did. Is understandable so far. <laughs> it's just that it's I I find it uh, remarkable that his childhood isn't that over the top. Well, we just don't know that much about like what happened in the orphanage or whatever. Oh, like that's a, true. A fucking Soviet orphanage in the late forties. That probably wasn't the best yeah, place. Yeah, could probably mess you up. Probably some bad stuff happened. Yeah, uh, but I I really don't know because there's just not like Turkmenistan is still a very closed society, so there's not a whole lot of information on. I his can't childhood. imagine this guy. <laughs> Keeping good records <laughs> no. of what's going on. Not a big fan of that. Mm. Now, um, Turkmenistan launched its own currency, uh, the Manat, uh, in the late or in the early 1990s. Its great wealth meant that the money launched at parity with the U.S. dollar. So at the start, the Turkmenistan Manat is worth one U.S. dollar, oh. which is great. You yeah. know, yeah, new country. Your dollar is a pretty good thing to be worth in the early 1990s. Yeah, uh, Niyazov's face was, of course, prominently printed on each and every bill. Sure. Um, now, it's not true that his popularity was without conflict. Dissidents were punished brutally. Uh, 
although he was pretty popular at first because the Turkmen had been treated like shit by the Soviet Union, and now that they were independent, uh, there was enough money for both ridiculous statues and social programs. So Turkmen Bashi tripled the salaries of public employees, he heavily subsidized food, and he offered free gas, electricity, and water to all citizens. Hey. He also spent $130 million turning his presidential 767 into an airborne palace. Oh. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> A little bit for you, a little bit for me. A little bit for you, a lot, lot for me. Yeah, yeah. Just gold statues for me. Right. Gasoline's basically free. Uh, so, you know. <laughs> I mean, as a citizen at this point. It's not the worst case scenario. It's not the worst It's not the so worst far. case scenario. Yeah. It's just like, okay, well, there's a bunch of just terrible statues of this guy. <laughs> really bad statues. But all you know place. what? I'm not I'm not paying for gas. I'm so. not paying for gas. So who am I to complain? We will see where this story goes. Uh but speaking of not complaining, you know what makes me not complain? I wanna say ads? Yes, ads for the ad product, a couple of services. Oh, okay. Maybe maybe even an ad for bubbly sparkling water. The only sparkling water that tastes terrible when mixed with LaCroix. Is that a, is that gonna get us any money, Sophie? <laughs> 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 All right. Ads! And we're back. We're talking about Turkmenbashi, uh, dictator of Turkmenistan. And at this point, not doing terrible. Mm -hmm. A lot of statues. Way too much money on the plane. Gold baby. I'm really thinking about that gold baby thing. Because I think what it is is that making a statue of yourself as an adult, like, yeah, that's messed up. But it's celebrating your birth as yeah. this special event. Yeah. Like, there's really only the one person that we do that with. Yep. Yeah, if someone else is doing it, like, that's it's a bold statement. It's a bold statement. And I got to say, Dave, you're really on the right track. Okay. With that, uh, with that. Oh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, delightful. <laughs> so. Uh, at this point, Niazov does not seem like the worst case scenario for a dictator. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Turkmen people were at least getting something while he robbed the country blind. But Niazov's corruption quickly took its toll on the national economy. After bribing former U.S. Secretary of State Alexander Haig to lobby on Turkmenistan's behalf, he almost succeeded in getting the Clinton administration to open the country up to American investment. The deal got derailed because Niazov demanded 33% of all invested money go to him personally. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I can see them whipping that out on the yep. negotiation yep. table, and they're like, what? But I get a third of everything. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> now, this turned out to be a bad idea, because most of Turkmenistan's regional trading partners, the former Soviet states, suffered economic collapses after their first few years of capitalism. Uh, they stopped being able to buy Turkmenistan's fuel, production fell by two-thirds, and all that sweet plane and statue money stopped coming in. Niazov responded to this with an effort to boost the country's internal economy. He did this by modernizing the capital, Ashgabat. Uh, According to the book Inside Central Asia by Dilip Hero, quote, Modernizing Ashgabat meant raising many central neighborhoods to create a network of boulevards with lavish palaces of white marble and green-tinted glass, dotted with massive fountains and statues of Niazov and his parents, as well as historical Turkmen personalities, guarded by uniformed security men standing to attention. The city would become the site of the largest fountain in the world, a multi-storied shopping mall with water gushing out of the roof and pouring down in a ring of waterfalls. Its main avenue would end up with 22 five-star hotels, where foreign guests would be accommodated only in the rooms that were bugged. Many of the displaced mm. families did not get alternative accommodation or compensation as they could not prove the ownership of their homes. How modern. <laughs> <laughs> so he just bulldozes hundreds of houses, oh. builds 22 hotels, and nobody's visiting Turkmenistan at this point. Like, there's no foreign visits. Yeah, but did you hear about that fountain? <laughs> that fucking fountain's the shit. <laughs> That's when I think the future. I think, how can we make water fall in neat ways? That is what the future is. Oh, yeah. And and how can we fill a city with enough gold fountains that we need to have permanent security guards stationed to stop people from right. stealing the gold because we bulldozed their houses and they're all poor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Solid move. Oh. Solid move. Now, building a shitload of hotels and additional statues during an economic downturn may not seem like a great idea, but that's just because you and I aren't economic geniuses like Turkmen Bashi. Sure. Yeah. Now, to keep the economy afloat, Turkmenistan's central bank started printing money like it was going out of fucking style. Mm. Inflation hit 3,000%, and the Minot went from being at one-to-one parity with the U.S. dollar to being at 5,200-to-one parity with the U.S. dollar. (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, things so, took a turn. <laughs> things took a re- Turns out that's not a great strategy. Yeah, no. Nobody could have predicted that. No. No, I mean, you know, it's the economy. Nobody knows. It's like it's like uh, predicting that offering people a lot of ballooning interest rate mortgages on their houses and like loans and stuff would eventually lead to a massive foreclosure crisis. Yeah, who could have saw that who could who could have seen that coming? No, they did all the right things. They got the statues, they, they got, got the, the gold statues. fountains. And you, what is it Warren Buffett always says when the economy's bad, build more fountains. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's basic economics 102 at least. Yeah. Now, uh, as his entire nation suffered, so did Turkmen Bashi. His doctors told him that his arteries had hardened, probably because of his massive chronic alcoholism and oh, okay. constant cigarette smoking. Uh, he would need major heart surgery, which he received in a German clinic. Uh, he survived the surgery, but it seems to have wrought a change in him. Up to this point, he had been the absolute ruler of Turkmenistan, but he was more or less normal for like an absolute ruler, you know, banning political parties, building tons of statues, secret police, mm-hmm. nothing super wild. Like, like, like it was some fun stuff, but like, yeah, and, yeah, dictator stuff. Yeah, as far as like ruthless dictators go, this is pretty by the book. Pretty by the book. After his heart surgery, Niazov began to treat his nation as an extension of himself. His doctor told him he had to stop smoking, so he ordered all cabinet ministers to stop smoking too. He banned smoking in public places and even smoking out in the street. That sucks. <laughs> yeah, it really sucks. <laughs> Why can't we smoke outside anymore? The president's heart's you bad. You turned my house into a gold fountain. <laughs> yeah. Let me smoke. Oh, let me smoke. <laughs> my oh. house is a statue of you as a baby. Yeah. <laughs> 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 While he was rebuilding his capital in the Muslim Las Vegas and dealing with heart issues and being a nut, Turkmen Bashi managed to maintain his policy of careful, stringent neutrality. He joined the non-aligned movement in 1995 and commemorated the event with a 170-foot-tall neutrality arch in downtown Ashgabat. It is described as an amalgam of a trifid Eiffel Tower and a marble-covered space rocket. Sophie, I... I, I oh, okay, I'll, I'll finish describing this first, but can you look up the neutrality arch so I can show Dave? Now, a few years later, after his heart surgery, Turkmen Bashi added another statue to the top of the neutrality arch. A 22-foot-tall, golden-plated statue of himself, wearing Superman's cape with his arms extended into the air. Holy the shit. statue rotates 360 degrees all, every day, so his face is always facing the sun. Turkmen Bashi required that the statue be visible from the international airport many miles away from the city. Also, the airport was named after him. Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> this is Now, this is reminding me of that Futurama episode where Bender builds the giant statue. This is exactly Remember that. me. Like, did it shoot fire out of it? No, but it's it's pretty close to that. Oh, Sophie's. Shit. We'll have a picture up on the website. Look at that fucking oh, thing. Oh yeah, when I think the word neutral. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what that's I think. what I think of when I think of neutral. <laughs> Holy shit! I love that he saw that. He was like, needs another statue. Needs on another it. statue of me made out of gold, wearing a cape. Oh my god. So Turkmen Bashi took his neutrality as seriously as he took his absurd statues and monuments. He renamed the official newspaper from Turkmenistan to Neutral Turkmenistan. He replaced the national anthem, Turkmenistan, with Independent Neutral Turkmenistan State Anthem. He wrote both the words and the music for this song. Oh, no. (laughs) I'm just going to read the words. I'm just going to read the first verse because I find it funny. Yeah. I don't know how to sing this. I am ready to give life for our native hearth. The spirit of ancestors, descendants are famous for. My land is sacred. My flag flies in the world. A symbol of the great neutral country flies. This is why you got to outsource your your songwriting. You you really got to outsource your songwriting. (laughs) Dictators of tomorrow don't think you can do everything. It's also of the of the ways to inspire a people. The word neutral is not one of them. No, (laughs) like. The Swiss are neutral, it but that's not least like the passionate sens- yeah. uh, word. It's again a, another Futurama reference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. In 1998, post surgery, Turkmen Bashi succeeded in getting a second chance to dance with Uncle Sam. He made some deals that included Unocal, an American corporation, helping Turkmenistan to build a gigantic pipeline. The fact that an American company won the contract looked very good to the White House. There was talk of okaying more investment in Turkmenistan. But in January of that year, those pesky State Department bastards released their yearly report on human rights. They noted that Turkmenistan had made basically no progress towards democracy since leaving the Soviet Union. The Clinton administration asked Niazov to give them what Hero's book calls a gesture towards democratization. In return, Turkmenbashi would be invited to the White House. 
Now, he'd visited the U.S. once before, shortly after taking power, but he'd been ignored by everybody. Uh, and this was something Turkmenbashi very badly wanted, for reasons I don't understand, but probably boil down to ego. He wanted pictures with the American president. Right. That was like his thing. So that February, Niyazov got up in front of Turkmenistan's high officials and promised to amend the Constitution, giving more power to Parliament and less to himself. True to his word, Bill Clinton invited him to the White House. Turkmenbashi immediately reneged on his promises now that he had the invitation and said that any constitutional amendments would have to wait until the parliamentary elections in December of 1999. What a shocker. <laughs> what a shocker. You can't just be like, look, you have to, you have to say you'll do this. And then you can take pictures with me. Like, you have to make sure they actually follow through, right? I mean, if we cared about democracy. That's a good point. <laughs> then yes, that's I don't we know do if things. we cared. We're like, look, you have to at least pretend. Yeah. Like, just so we can all look good. Yeah. For at least a moment. For at least a second. Yeah. L- let us pretend that we care about freedom around right. the world. Which, you know, he did. He, he gave Americans the ability to feel like the good guys for one last time before 9-11. That's true. That's true. So thank you, Turkmen Bashi. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Niazov spent a fun week in the United States hanging out with Bill Clinton and Al Gore and talking about democracy uh, and all the democracy that he was totally going to bring to his people. Mm-hmm. There were, of course, questions from the press and outrage from people who didn't like dictators. Uh, I'm going to quote from the book Inside Central Asia here. Quote, in his press briefing, the White House spokesman explained that, just as in the case of China, the U.S. national economic interest outweighed the administration's concern over Niazov's dismal record on post-Soviet reform. When questioned on the issues of civil liberties and multi-party democracy at such forums as the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, Niazov repeated an ar- the argument that political liberalization would follow only after independence and stability had been consolidated. His statement that no one had been admin- arrested in Turkmenistan for political reasons flew in the face of the recent State Department report on Turkmenistan. The op- Opposition was repressed, with leading dissidents either imprisoned or committed to psychiatric hospitals. Mm. The reality is that uh, roughly 20,000 people had been imprisoned. Right. Uh, so, it's frustratingly hard to find many stories of the victims of Turkmenbashi's regime, because again, it's still a pretty close society. Uh, the imprisoned were generally tracked by secret police after being freed to keep them from talking. I did find one Telegraph article that interviewed a former enemy of the state. Here's what he said about his time uh, in a Turkmenistan prison. Quote, I had read about the beatings and electric shock therapy which I experienced in prison, but it was the unexpected techniques that really damaged me. I was fitted with a gas mask and the air vent was closed. They played tapes of my relatives being beaten after they were arrested. Their suffering was mine. It was terrible. Wow. Yeah, that it, he did not mass execute people. Uh, he did have some people killed, but he didn't do mass executions. His thing seems to be if you stepped out of line, he'd arrest your whole family and beat the shit up. Yeah, them. that is. And then tape them and uh, that is a up. creative way to be a fucking villain. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, it is one of those uh, one of those dictator strategies that I hadn't run into yet, which is like like obviously people's families being threatened. Oh them, yeah, but like that specific way. It's like okay, well at least you're an innovator. Oof. Yeah. Uh, he also tortured shitloads of people, although he did, you know, avoid the mass murder that, like, a guy like Bashar al-Assad mm-hmm. is famous for. Uh, Turkmen Bashi was smart enough to avoid doing anything too obviously horrible, like, you know, bombing, you know, a dissident chunk of the city or whatever. And so he never really provoked mass outrage from the United States or any of its allies. Since he only tortured and imprisoned people, uh, our government was happy to take his money, or to be more accurate, let major U.S. corporations take his money. Right, he's staying under the radar he's here. Staying right under the radar. Yeah. There. Smart guy, smart guy. 1999's elections came. Uh, 98.9% of the country showed up to choose between 104 candidates for 50 seats in the parliament. So he kept his promise. People got to vote. Oh, wow. Yeah, they got to vote for, for parliament. Now, all of the candidates were members of the same party, which he headed, uh, but... It's, it's something, <laughs> but it's a yeah. You've you've yeah, you got to press a button or like write a name. You got down. To, yeah, absolutely. You pull that crank. You, you vote got to write you, a name. It's democracy. It's rolling. You had yeah. twice as many choices as there were seats. Yeah, and even though they were all from the, it's something. Uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe did not send out election observers, which they normally do in situations like this, because the elections were seen as too much of a sham to be worth observing. Uh, <laughs> After the election, the delegates who had been voted in unanimously declared that Niazov was president for life. Oh, wow. Ah, yeah, I, democracy. So, so, so lucky for him. <laughs> He's, he really nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> he must really like him there. They, he must be very popular. Yeah. Now, President for Life Niazov introduced a new set of civil rights for his citizens. So this is, 
is seeming like okay. he's making his promise. Yeah, I mean, he didn't he didn't choose to be president. No, he the people demanded exactly. that he be president and now for he's life. He's going to help them out. And he gave them new civil rights. Yeah. Uh, he did not, however, have a great grasp on what civil rights are. <laughs> what uh, a surprise. <laughs> so his first new civil right was to cancel all internet licenses except the state-owned teleco- <laughs> telecom company. <laughs> <laughs> Continuing to prove that he really didn't have a good handle on the concept of civil rights, Niazov next banned ballet and opera, calling oh. them a- <laughs> calling them alien to Turkmen culture. <laughs> Somewhere there's like a smoking ballet dancer. <laughs> just like, I can't have a cigarette, I can't do ballet. Just staring at that golden baby. Yeah. Like... <laughs> God damn it. Uh, yeah. Uh, he ordered the country's few movie theaters shut down, but he did replace the movie theaters with a single enormous puppet theater in the what, capital. What is wrong with him? <laughs> he okay. likes puppets. What Don't you like puppets? What happened at that orphanage? <laughs> that's that's the real question with <laughs> this guy. Did he befriend a puppet? <laughs> Like a roll of cellulose fell out of a movie theater and crushed his favorite puppeteer. Yeah, this is starting to feel like he's he's trolling his country on purpose. Like, I'm going to get rid of the movie theaters and give them puppet shows. <laughs> give them puppet shows. Oh, Christ. <laughs> yeah, his exact justification was something along the lines of, like, all these movies made by foreign people are going to make people not like the way we talk here in Turkmenistan. Right. Well, so I don't wanna, yeah, I don't if he's that. trying to control the internet and movies, yeah. he's, he's definitely trying to... Make people in this country not realize just how screwed they are at the moment. Yeah, how how not not great it is to yeah. not be able to fucking banning ballet. <laughs> like, what's subversive about ballet? Even right. Stalin had ballets. Still, you could make your own movies. Yeah, about ballet. He must have like dated a ballet dancer or something. Got his heart broken. Yeah, this, it yeah. all feels so personal. Yeah, it really does. Like that's the thing. That's the thing that's weird about this guy is that every decision he makes feels like. Like a guy who got pissed at something and right. like then banned it for the entire country. Right. But like uh, cigarettes gonna... fucked up my heart. Nobody gets to smoke. Yeah. <laughs> As someone who loves movies, I'm real, I'm real peeved about the movie thing. Because if you're going to ban movies and then make better movies or something, don't replace it with puppets because your people are going to see that and be like, I know there's something better than this out there. <laughs> I, I know it gets better than puppets. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know this is the best we could do. Yeah. <laughs> So, in 2001, President for Life and puppet lover Turkmen Bashi mm. embarked on the next great chapter of his career as a dictator and as a luminary. He wrote a book. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Not just any book. His opus, the Runama, was billed by him as the most important book since the Quran. Part history text, part guide to life, part religious book, and all crazy, the Runama was the pinnacle of everything insane dictator literature can be. Here's how Turkmen Bashi described the book in his own introduction. Runama is a visit to this land. Runama is a visit to the past of this territory and a visit to the future of this territory. Runama is the visit made to the heart of the Turkmen. Runama is a sweet spiritual fruit grown in this territory. No human being who has not experienced what I have lived through can understand me. Oh, wow. He's yeah, a little bit of emo there. He's at real the end. special. Yeah. He's a real special boy. He's a real special boy. Yeah. Now, the book is partly fictional, jumping between modern day and the Middle Ages, and focused around a character, Saparmurat Niazov, mm. uh, whose birth was ordained by God himself. Ah, uh, there it is. Yeah. A character with his name who is God's prophet on earth. Mm hmm. <laughs> wonder if it's based on anyone. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> <laughs> if you're gonna write a book like this at least do it under a different name or something because you can't say you're god <laughs> well god's prophet on earth god's prophet on he's earth. not saying he's better than mohammed just that he's newer than mohammed and so should be taken more seriously than the prophet of the muslim faith. right he's the new hip mohammed he's yeah. the new the new cool mohammed yeah okay he'll let you drink but you can't smoke right which i i mean i guess actually that's a that is a help well yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is kind of a wash, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we are going to talk about the Runama, and I'm going to read you some of its timeless wisdom. Uh, but first, you know what else is timelessly wise? Oh, God. I, w- I want to say ads again. You're, 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 you nailed it. Ah, two for two. All right. Products. We're back. All right. So uh, we're talking about the Runama, 
uh, a book in which Saparmurat Niazov writes about himself as God's prophet. Mm-hmm. Uh, he goes on a quest to discover the history of the Turkmens, uh, and during that quest, he learns that he is God's son, essentially. Uh, oh, good for him. Good for him. Yeah, he, well, he, he was a child ordained by God, and probably, probably his mom was uh, impregnated by divine will. Uh, in other words, Saparmurat Niazov wrote an explicitly Turkmen-themed Bible with himself as Jesus and mixed it with a self-help book in like one of those history books Bill O'Reilly writes. Like, that's that's kind of the Runama in a nutshell. It's all these red flags just smushed together. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Now, I'm going to level with you all. I did not have time this week to read the entirety of the Runama. I may get back to it someday because apparently reading it three times guarantees you entry into heaven. Yeah, I think next vacation or something, just read it on the yeah, beach. just read it on the beach. Yeah. Uh, I did learn, uh, reading Paul Thoreau's New Yorker article, that apparently you you are guaranteed a trip to heaven if you read it three times. So, you know, people out there, if you're sinning, if you're, if you're doing anything terrible, uh, maybe read the Runama yeah. three times in a row. I also feel like more books should use that for yeah. marketing. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, well... I mean, they're probably wrong, but what if they're right? What if Mine they're right? Well. It's just three yeah, times Yeah, you buy the book, book once, yeah. and then you just got to read it three just times. Yeah, you got to read it three times. Does it sorry, Does it count if you do like the thing where like Kindle, like where it reads the book for you, <laughs> and you, you can do it on like double on speed? <laughs> I don't know if that would trick God, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let, I, let me read to you where Paul Thoreau learned that this was apparently what Saparmurat was saying. Okay. Uh, he, he apparently was told this by a cab driver during a visit to Turkmenistan. So I'm going to quote from that conversation. He was on TV last night, my driver said. Well, he's on almost every night. <laughs> Turkmen almost never said Turkmen Bashi's name aloud. He said, if you read my book three times, you will go to heaven. How does he know this? He said, I asked Allah to arrange it. So, oh. Yeah. So he told Allah to do So this. he told God that if you read his book three times... Anyone who re- he told it's God, like a promo code. Yeah, exa- exactly. Yeah. He's doing what like, like podcasters yeah. do. <laughs> Look, God, can we work something out here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is the heavenly equivalent of of offering a discount code on a mattress. Wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good for him working with God. Yeah, working yeah. with God. Now, Paul Thoreau, being a better journalist than me, read the entirety of the Runama. He described it as a confused mixture of memoir, Turkmen lore, potted history, dietary suggestions, Soviet bashing, boasting, wild promises, and Turkmen Bashi's poems. He seemed to <laughs> regard it as both a sort of Quran and as a how-to guide for the Turkmen people, a jingoistic pep talk. In fact, it is little more than a sopophoric chloroform imprint as Mark Twain described the Book of Mormon. I read it once. Turkmen Bashi would have to promise more than heaven for me to read it two more times. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> if you're not a dictator, we call this a manifesto. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is just the ravings of a madman. And I do feel like in another society, Turkmen Bashi is a guy who mails people bombs and forces the New York Times to print his manifesto. Yeah, and it, it's it's those little things that's like hidden in there, like recipes. Yeah, <laughs> poems. recipes, poems. <laughs> and it's like, oh, you just want to be listened to. Yeah, you were just dictating this to somebody yeah. and stopped at some it's point. It's a string of consciousness. <laughs> Now, I did skin the Runama uh, in search of some of the apparently ageless wisdom that Turkmen Bashi blessed the world with in his book. Uh, I can tell it's definitely the book of an old man who is worried about dying because he writes about time a lot. Mm. But the way he writes about time makes no sense at all to me. Quote, the devil keeps a close eye over your time and faith, both of which are your precious belongings. Time is your life in this world, and faith is your life in the other world. Wasting time means losing one's life or oneself. Teach your child how to save his time and life. All that you can save of time will belong to you. Time is a mace. Hit or be hit. Huh. I don't understand that So you can sentence. hit time? <laughs> what does that mean? Like, at, I get saving time. It's valuable to have more time, obviously. Right. What does time as a mace mean? How do you hit someone with time? I'm trying. I, I mean, I want to know how. I want to, to know that. how. How do you get hit with time? Like jail? Yeah. I, I feel that, like maybe yeah. like Marty McFly had this experience. Marty McFly might might be the only person who's taken Turkmen Bashi's advice. Yeah, get hit by the DeLorean from Back to <laughs> the Future. He did get hit by the DeLorean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, we're. We're, we're we're finding some logic in this. Yeah, he, I'm gonna it, be I'm gonna be thinking about this one for it, a while. You know, he did come to power in the mid '80s, so it's possible he was a big Back to the Future <laughs> fan. <laughs> yeah, DeLorean is it's metallic. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that could make sense. Turkmenbashi also had a lot to say on the subject of laziness. He was not for it. 
Quote, Laziness means being profligate and living one, leaving oneself to be blown about by the winds of fate. Be hardworking, and you will generate returns in cash. Be lazy, and you will get into debt. The comfort that laziness provides is like the taste of a sour cucumber. Out of mercy for yourself, work. Joblessness, lack of wisdom, and laziness will damage you more than your enemies ever could. Time is a wild predator, but if you train it, you may use it to your benefit. Do not be subject to time. Let it be your subject. Live so that you regret nothing when you die. Living does not only mean passing time. It means reaching eternity after passing through time. I don't think you should train time by hitting it, though. Yeah, that doesn't seem. That seems like time's going to grow up like abused and probably. Yeah, I don't want that. time to turn on me. You do not want time to turn on you. Yeah. Uh, although that is the one thing time does to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Also, bold decision uh, speaking out against laziness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah. Really, really, a really dagger innovative. Into the... <laughs> <laughs> now, the Runama also includes handy advice on how to obtain world peace. Quote. If everybody likes their own nation, then the nations will like each other. Mm. <laughs> it feels like... I think that's not how that works. <laughs> I think that's the opposite of how that works. <laughs> yeah, I think historically, <laughs> I feel when like a nation that... really likes itself, <laughs> that's, that's it the becomes first a step. problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first step to other nations ceasing to exist. Yes. <laughs> is one nation really a liking nation itself. Likes itself so much that it's like, guys, you got to try this yeah. nation. <laughs> yeah. You got to try being Germany. Yeah. It's, it's pretty sweet here in Germany. Yeah. Oh, you don't want some? No, come here. Come here. <laughs> come here. Come You're going to try this. You're going to take some Germany. Yeah. <laughs> You'll love it. You'll love it. Turkmenistan, we, like, that's what the Soviet Union did to them. <laughs> They're just like, right. This is going so well. <laughs> we're just going <laughs> to keep going going <laughs> now the runama also includes handy advice oh sorry i already read that part i didn't edit this uh which is unusual for me because i'm a hack and a fraud so everyone should we're know going, that no this is raw we're going we're raw dogging it this is punk rock we're we are we're raw, are, dogging, we're it. raw dogging this <laughs> that, that passed me by podcast. for a second yeah. oh. that's one of my favorite terms it's just so visceral and gross it really is <laughs> it's just the nastiest way to describe that oh i love it okay so, are you wondering, Dave, how Niazov defined the concept of a nation? Oh, yes. Yeah, well, <laughs> nation is the transformation of human groups in the context of certain spiritual foundations. A nation is shaped materially according to these spiritual foundations. You get what he's... You need statues. <laughs> you need statues. <laughs> is, that, is that where he's going? Yeah. Is, you got to have... Yeah. It, like, you're not a nation unless you have, like, I don't know, 10 or more statues. Yeah, I mean, way more than 10 statues. Right. That's the minimum. That's though. Is that the minimum? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in the Runama, Turkmen Bashi credits the Turkmen people uh, with many great historical innovations, including the invention of robots, the invention of white wheat, and the invention of the wheel. The, what? Yeah. Robots and the wheel. How, how did he... How did robots get into that? I, did, I do not know, Dave. <laughs> yeah. I can see, like, anybody can kind of claim the wheel. Yeah. Because it's like, who's going to prove them wrong? Who's going to prove you wrong? Yeah. yeah. Might have been Turkman. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, for all we know. But robots, I feel like we have that written down where <laughs> I that feel came like from. We're pretty clear on robots. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I cannot say that my limited reading of the Runama has led me to any staggering revelations about my place in the universe. Mm. But Niazov was adamant that his people needed to read this book. He required anyone entering a mosque or a church to kiss a copy of the Renama before going into worship. And, Excellent. Yeah. In a different New Yorker article by Macy Halford, I found one possible explanation of Niazov's motivation in writing the Runama. The person who provided it is just described as a scholar, I think because they're a person from Turkmenistan who doesn't want to have their family tortured. Fair enough. Yeah. Quote, Niazov was somewhat illiterate. He couldn't read or write Turkmen or Russian properly. People who have disabilities, for example, illiteracy, want to be seen as geniuses. That's probably what got him started. Mm. I don't know about that logic either. uh, Yeah. But... It's funny that he can't read. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely most dictators are compensating for things, right? Yeah, that part seems it's accurate. It probably starts with a, like a profound lack of confidence where it's like, you know, just you're, you're fine, man. You're yeah. fine. You don't have to build this many statues and, and he starve be- your people or b- bulldoze their houses or whatever. Yeah. Like, it's all right. You're fine. You're fine. Yeah. You're doing great, buddy. You, we were all impressed when you were an engineer. You, yeah. You didn't need to do a, the rest of this. That would have been a great career. <laughs> it would have been a great career. <laughs> he, would have, he would have done so much good things as yeah. a just as an engineer. Keeping the lights on, not building golden baby statues. You think that's where it started? As an engineer, he was like, you know, I, what I really need want to like engineer is statues. Is statues. Yeah. That's, yeah. Closer than, yeah. 
<laughs> is comfortable. So once it was published, uh, once the Renama was published, Turkmenbashi did everything in his power to make it a central part of Turkmenistan life. According to the book Inside Central Asia, Niyazov erected a commemorative complex in his home village of Gipjak, conceived as a symbol of the rebirth of the Turkmen nation, which included a mosque whose walls carry quotations from the Quran as well as the Runama. Oh. The Tur- <laughs> yeah, that's bold. Oh. <laughs> the Turkmen government ordered a prominent display of the Runama not only in bookshops and official buildings, but also in mosques and churches, sharing its place with the Quran or the Bible. A colossal pink statue of the Runama in Ashgabat was too conspicuous to be missed. Another decree extended the book's presence to libraries and schools and made it a part of the curriculum. To be able to recite passages of the book became a badge of honor. Next, civil servants, teachers, and doctors were required to pass a test on its teachings. Then, this requirement also became part of the driving test. The Runama was lauded in songs, and the state-run media regularly broadcast or printed excerpts from it. Criticizing the book, even in private, was tantamount to criticizing Niyazov, an offense punishable with a five-year jail sentence. Okay. Niyazov redesigned the educational system, reducing the compulsory schooling from two years to one uh, and higher education by three years down to a mere two. Inexplicably, he reduced the college and university enrollments to 10% of the then current figure. He banned the teaching of foreign languages and decreed that the exceptional history and culture of Turkmen must be stressed with his runama to act as the lodestar. Ugh. The worst part is this book sounds terrible. It's a terrible book, it's and like, then he bans other languages and yeah. cuts like reduces school by a half so that nobody has any education. Right. So that presumably they'll find his book more compelling. Exactly. Like, you yeah. can't have these people reading other books. No, yeah. It's like it's like if Neil Breen or Tommy Wiseau like yeah. opened a theater and had like Citizen Kane posters next to the room. Yeah. And it was just walled with that and like started a film school where they're like, look, we're just gonna focus on the room. On the classics. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, gradually they phase out Citizen Kane for just the Exactly. Yeah. He's trying to create he's basically lowering the bar yeah. as much as he can to make his book the best thing around. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. That's infuriating. Yeah. Now, uh you may have noted from uh from that passage I read uh, a little note about a statue of the Runama that was put up in the Capitol. Oh. I have a video of that statue, Dave. Oh, uh, and and it'll be up on our site behindthebastards.com. But I, I've got to show it to you, and I'd like you to describe it to our listeners because most of them are probably jogging or driving or sure. pooping at the moment and can't can't God, look at I the video. I hope they're pooping too. Okay, I'm not sure what I'm seeing right now. There's like cool, very cool, music. very cool music. I'm seeing a lot of colors. I feel like it should be high. Um, oh wow, it's a book. <laughs> It's a very colorful book. Is this a statue? This is a statue. It's opening. Oh my <laughs> god! <laughs> it is a giant <laughs> book. Ceremonially opens every night in Ashgabat. It opens every night. Mm-hmm. This is like a Disney attraction. <laughs> in this like this should be like the story of Snow White opening. It is the new Korra, the Azov <laughs> spiritual guide for the people. It's an interact. It's like a moving. Is that a project? The there's fountains. Of course, there's fountains. Of course, there's fountains. Children are expected to learn passages. Wow, he loves his book. <laughs> so does anyone who wants to get a driver's license. What? What is the point of that? Yeah, he made you memorize bits of it to get a driver's license. Yeah. Why? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much to unpack here. Yeah. So first of all, that. He loves his book so much that he made a giant statue that just opens. Yeah, a statue of like, his book that opens. Yeah, just like celebrating the act of opening his book. Mm-hmm. <sighs> okay, uh, so this driver's license. Yeah. What in the book helps with driving? Well, you got to know how to use time as a mace, Dave. Otherwise, you're going to get hit. So back to the DeLorean. Yeah, back to the DeLorean. Yeah, okay. <laughs> See, it all ties together. <sighs> the internal logic's consistent. I mean, I'm going to be honest. After writing a book, I was, I, I'm was i pretty proud of it. Uh, right. But, but I don't think I would build a, a giant statue of my book, A Brief History well, of Ice. I would build a statue of your book. but See, if you build it, it's fine. It is fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, you, you, <laughs> I, I should note that reading my book uh, will not help you pass a driver's test. Uh, it, it, you never know. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> don't sell yourself short. <laughs> <laughs> don't presume what people will take away from yeah. your book i learned how to merge from you <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is a running theme with uh, like Qaddafi with that astronaut thing yeah with the death of the astronaut the greatest short like story of all time dictators ha- are like brutal 
and do all these things. And then they're like, but you got to read my stuff. You got to read my book. It's just like, why don't we start with that? Like, let's all read their your book first and we'll praise you. And then you don't have to hurt everybody. It's, 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 you know what it is. Like when someone has a, a post go viral on Twitter unexpectedly and they link their SoundCloud or something. Yeah. It's the that, but if you're in charge of a country. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God, I'm in charge. Everybody look at this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so many follows. <laughs> yeah. Didn't expect this, guys. Didn't expect this, guys. Here's my PayPal. Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm in charge of where all the <laughs> oil and gas money goes, so it just goes right to my bank account. Uh, so that's all we're going to talk about in part one of this episode. But when we come back, we're going to talk about Turkmen Bashi's post-2001 career. And trust me, Dave. Shit's going to go even further off the rails. Turns out all the craziness we've talked about so far was just a dress rehearsal. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So, you got any pluggables you want to plug before we uh, we head out? I guess so. I uh, I have a, I have a podcast network that I run with Tom Ryman called uh, Gamefully Unemployed. You can check us out at patreon.com slash Gamefully Unemployed. We have a new show called Fox Mulder is a Maniac. It's, it's exclusive. Great. Yeah, it's uh, it's our behind the bastards, but just for Fox. Just Mulder. for Fox Mulder. Yeah, so check it out. Yeah, uh, donate to Gamefully Unemployed. Uh, fantastic podcasts. Uh, Tom and Dave are two of the funniest guys I know. Thank you. Please, please give them your dollars. Uh, give them your cents. Mm-hmm. Uh, mail them your your really thing. anything. Yeah, shirts, pants. Yeah. Oh God. Uh, yeah. The pop tarts. Uh, severed heads of horses. Mm-hmm. Uh, all of those things are appreciated. And look up this podcast on BehindTheBastards.com on the internet. Do it. And uh, you find the sources for this. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram and at BastardsPod. Uh, you have wonderful uh, t-shirts, too. We, we do. We have a we have a, we have a brand new uh, Do Crimes, Save Lives, Raul Wallenberg shirts. Uh, if you're a fan of our episode on Raul Wallenberg, you can get those from T Public Behind the Bastards shop. So help us. Uh, help ourselves to the money that we get from t-shirt sales. Also mail them horse heads. Also mail us horse heads. Yeah. Any kind of head, really. Yeah. Uh, no more Komodo dragon heads. We have gotten too many of those. Mm. Uh, full Komodo dragons are still welcome. Uh, very, sure. very appreciated, actually. I'm Robert Evans. This has been Behind the Bastards. Uh, I love 40% of you. Uh,